Hello, I'm Dee Dee West, and this is Broken Limelight. I am so excited because it's October, guys. So today's episode is going to be just a little bit different because I wanted to do something kind of spooky. Before I get into that, I have a little update to give you guys. This last Monday, R. Kelly was found guilty on all counts. I don't know if any of you guys followed this trial, but man, it was not like the first trial. His former entourage members took the stand. A lot of his victims took the stand. They showed a new tape where R. Kelly has sex with the girl, and both him and the girl repeatedly mentioned that she's only 14. His sentencing isn't until May 4th, 2022, but he will likely be facing decades in prison. Woo! It's the remix to Ignition. R. Kelly staying in prison. Fuck yeah, dude. I'm so I'm so happy for those victims. I know this is just a small victory for a lot of them, but I mean, it's something. It's the least that could have been done, but it finally happened. So today I'm going to tell you all about famous movies that are known to be cursed. These are films that had strange accidents happen on and off set. Some of the actors got sick and died. A lot of people argue whether some of this stuff is just coincidence, but some of the stuff is so eerie that it'll make a non-believer question things. Some of the better-known cursed films are The Poltergeist, The Exorcist, and The Omen. To start off, I'm going to tell you about the movie Poltergeist and why people believe that it's cursed. Poltergeist is a classic horror film from 1982. It was about a family that lived in a haunted house, and it starred six-year-old Heather O'Rourke as well as Dominique Dunn. Now, the main reason people believe that it's cursed is because it's rumored that instead of using plastic skeletons, they used real human skeletons. Joe Beth Williams, who played the mom, said, I assumed they were prop skeletons made of plastic or rubber. I found out, as did the crew, that they were using real skeletons because it's far too expensive to make fake skeletons out of rubber. So Dominique Dunn, she died just four months after the release of Poltergeist. She was dating a guy named John Sweeney, who was an angry, abusive, controlling dude. They would fight, even when they had company over. Friends of theirs had said that they had witnessed John ripping out chunks of her hair. Another friend said that he saw him strangle her and tried to kill her before he intervened. One time, John beat her so badly that she was covered in bruises, like she had a big black eye and a busted lip. She was filming an episode of Hill Street Blues where she played a victim of abuse, and they actually didn't put any makeup on her. They had her appear just like she was. So if you ever watch that episode, all those bruises and marks on her face are all real. Which is kind of alarming. Like, did anyone do anything to try to help? Or were they just like, oh, you look perfect. Let's do this. And then just move on. In October 1982, Dominique was at home rehearsing with actor David Packer when John showed up and insisted on talking to her on the porch. David said that he heard arguing before he heard a smacking sound and then a loud thud. He went outside and he saw John standing over her body and John said, call 911. David called 911 and they told him that it was out of their jurisdiction. But like they couldn't contact the right jurisdiction for him or something. So he also called a friend and he told them, if I'm found dead, John Sweeney is the killer. Police did show up and John met them in the driveway with his hands up and said, I killed my girlfriend and I tried to kill myself. So that's the first death from the poltergeist. Actor Will Sampson was concerned about the use of real skeletons in the first film, and he offered to perform a real-life exorcism. He's believed to have conducted the ceremony alone and in the middle of the night, but the cast reportedly felt relieved afterwards. However, less than a year after the film's release, the curse had claimed another victim. Allegedly. Sampson had longtime health problems as he had suffered from a a degenerative condition called scleroderma, which affected his heart and lungs. He underwent a heart and lung transplant in the summer of 1987, but died of post-operative kidney failure on June 3rd. The little girl who played Carol Ann was named Heather O'Rourke. She was the girl who got sucked into the TV, and she was just six years old. She was in Poltergeist 1, 2, and 3. She died just four months before the movie's release, the last movie's release, at age 12. In January 1988, Heather fell ill with what appeared to be flu-like symptoms. She collapsed the following day and was rushed to a hospital. 
She had surgery, but went into cardiac arrest again in recovery, and doctors were unable to save her. She passed away in February 1988, just weeks after her 12th birthday, and it was later reported that she died from congenital stenosis and septic shock. Then there's the actor Lou Perryman. He became the second cast member to fall victim to murder. He played Pugsley in the original movie, and he suffered a brutal end in 1992 when he was hacked to death with an axe at age 67. A convict recently released from prison named Seth Christopher Tatum confessed he'd killed Perryman at his home after coming off his medication and going on a drinking binge. Actor Richard Lawson played one of the parapsychologists, and he almost fell victim. He just barely survived a plane crash that claimed the lives of 27 of the 51 passengers, but Lawson was, of course, among one of the survivors. He put his lucky escape down to a last-minute seat change that saved his life. So that's Poltergeist. Now the next one I'm going to talk about is The Exorcist, and this one is a little bit spookier. The urban legend says that anyone associated with the film The Exorcist would be cursed for life. If you haven't seen The Exorcist from 1973, you gotta go watch it. And now is the perfect time. The movie was the first scary movie of this magnitude. It was the first horror film to be nominated for an Academy Award for Best Picture. And, like, just seeing this young girl, like, saying these fucked up things was scary enough. But the picture and everything else, all the gore, like, it was it was so new at that time. People threw up in the movie theaters. Some people started, or some theaters started handing out barf bags. People straight up fainted. One lady actually passed out and slipped out of her chair, and her face hit the chair in front of her, and she broke her jaw. She sued, by the way, and Warner Brothers settled with her outside of court. Believe it or not, The Exorcist was actually based on a true story. There was a case that happened in Maryland in 1949, and it's known as The Exorcism of Ronald Doe. The victim, Ronald, was a 12-year-old boy who was believed to be possessed by a demonic spirit. Supposedly, his Aunt Harriet gave him a Ouija board, and when Aunt Harriet died, spooky stuff started happening. Apparently, wherever Ronald was, furniture would move on its own and things would start levitating. The family took him to a pastor who was like, nah, you gotta go see the Catholics about this one. So they saw a priest who took them to a hospital and they performed an exorcism on Ronald there. Allegedly, during the exorcism, Ronald had his his arms restrained but was somehow able to get his hand loose and he reached under the bed real quick and like, broke a bed spring from the, from the bottom of the mattress, and he slashed the priest's arm with it. So they had to end the exorcism there. Before the next exorcism ritual began, another priest, Walter Halloran, was called to the psychiatric wing of the hospital, where he was asked to assist. William Van Roo, a third priest, was also there to assist. Halloran stated that during this scene, words like evil and hell along with other marks, appeared on the boy's body. Apparently, during the exorcism, the boy's mattress started to shake, and he broke Halloran's nose during the process. Halloran told a reporter that after that second ritual, the boy was able to go on and live a normal life. Cast and crew members of the film were also said to have witnessed things levitating or moving on their own. Like, for example, um, multiple people saw a phone floating in the air, and then dropping on the floor. The film faced a few production delays, but one of the most notable was a fire that engulfed the set for Reagan's family home. Reagan was the main character who was possessed. So the whole house where the exorcism occurred burned in flames except her room. Her room was like completely untouched. It's believed that a pigeon flew into a circuit box and that's what caused the fire. This happened while no one was there, so no one was hurt, but it did set back production by about six weeks. During filming, actor Jason Miller, who played a priest in the movie, was approached by a real priest on the street. The priest apparently knew nothing about the movie, but he said to Jason, Reveal the devil for the trickster that he is. He will seek retribution against you, or he will even try to stop what you are doing to try to unmask him. The first time the film was screened in Rome, there was a lightning storm, and the theater was located right in between two churches. A lightning strike hit a giant 400-year-old cross and made it fall. There are reportedly nine deaths associated with the film. They all occurred before filming was even completed. And when I say associated with, I mean 
deaths that happened to the cast or crew members or their relatives. The first was actor Jack McGowan. In the movie, he was Reagan's first victim. In real life, he died from complications with the flu shortly after they finished filming, at just 54 years old. He died in January 1973, 11 months before the movie's release. Less than a month later, the actress who played Father Karras' mother and died in the hospital in the movie, she died of natural causes too. That was the only movie she ever acted in. Linda Blair and Ellen Burson were both injured on set. Both injured their backs really badly from the scenes where they're harnessed and like thrown around the set. People attribute this to the curse, but Ellen has said that the crew members who controlled their harnesses were way too rough, and Linda also said that they just weren't always secured properly. Those are the main ones that are connected directly to the cast and crew. So the last movie I want to talk about is The Omen. The Omen came out in 1976, and it was about a couple and the boy they adopted named Damien, who was the Antichrist. The movie is said to be one of the most cursed movies ever, Rumors started spreading around Hollywood that Satan was trying to stop the film from being made. In October 1975, Gregory Peck was on a plane and started a film, and a lightning strike caused the plane engine to catch fire, and the plane came dangerously close to a crash landing in the Atlantic Ocean. Just a few weeks after that, or some sources said just a couple days after that, a producer, May Snewfield, was on his way to film, and his plane was also struck by lightning while crossing the Atlantic Ocean. And then not long after that, David Seltzer was on a plane, and his got struck by lightning, too. There was also an incident where the crew was supposed to get on a plane, and their flight was changed at the last minute. The original plane that they were supposed to be on apparently took off and flew right into a flock of birds, obstructing the view and disorienting the flight crew. What's even weirder is that the plane crashed into a car, and that car actually had the family of the pilot inside of it. There were no survivors. The film's producer, Mace Newfield, had made plans to go to a restaurant one evening, but before they even got there, the building was destroyed in an explosion. Not long after that, Newfield and his wife checked out early from their hotel in London, and shortly after that, the hotel had another explosion. Most reports actually blame the Irish Republican Army for the explosions. The special effects designer, who was responsible for the famous decapitation scene, he fell victim to an event that was eerily similar to that scene. He was driving with his wife and was in a head-on crash that decapitated his wife. Even spookier, he said that on the side of the road there was a sign that pointed to a, ca- a town called Amen, or it was O-M-M-E-N, and then it said 66.6 km, so it was like Amen 66.6 kilometers away. There was an animal trainer working with the baboons that they used in the film, The day after they filmed that scene, the trainer was mauled by a tiger. The tiger grabbed him by the head and killed him instantly. There was also a scene where they used trained Rottweilers. One day, Gregory Peck's stuntman was attacked by the dogs. They ignored all the commands from their trainer, and they were able to cause some pretty heavy injuries. Fortunately, though, he did not die. Some people actually believe that the omen isn't actually cursed, but rather blessed by the devil. The idea is that the devil craves the attention, so he wasn't actually causing harm to the crew, but rather protecting them while violence happened around them. So that's it for today. I know this episode was a little bit different, but hey, it's October. Happy Halloween. And I thought it was better than going on some long hiatus again while I go and read a couple books, because I've got some pretty, pretty good cases coming up soon this month. All right, guys. Well, thanks again for listening. Don't forget, you can always just check on www.brokenlimelight.com and you can find all our links to social media there. You can find all our show notes, any updates, any questions. You can contact me there, everything. So I'll just let it be. (laughs) If you want to send in a donation, you can actually also do that from brokenlimelight.com. Just go to the tab that says donate and that'll take you straight to the donation page, which is buymeacoffee.com slash ddwest. Okay, guys, thanks again so, so much for listening, and I hope you keep listening. Until next time, bye. Today's episode is brought to you by Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is a monthly mystery subscription box that's truly one of a kind. 
It's basically like a crime case in a box. It comes with case files, codes to decipher, detailed backgrounds about the suspects and the victims. There's evidence for you to evaluate. It tells an immersive story of a whole crime case from beginning to end. It's kind of like an escape room in a box. You can do this by yourself, or you can team up with a buddy, or do it for like a game night or even a date night. You can take a little break from technology and immerse yourself fully into this box, or if you prefer to be more of a high-tech investigator, you can join online communities and talk to other Hunt a Killer players about clues and stuff. Hunt a Killer also shares part of its proceeds with the Cold Case Foundation, which helps with real-life cold cases. The best part is that Broken Limelight listeners get 20% off of their first subscription box. So get started now at huntakiller.com and be sure to use code BROKENLIMELIGHT to get your 20% off.